say a few introductions. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's uh, Wednesday, March 15th, 2023. Um, this is video number one of two. This is the lecture demo video. Uh, we're talking about stories without words today. And today we're very happy and lucky to have Tara Wayama with us, a guitarist and composer. Um, he's gonna play a little piece for you um, that he wrote, and then we're gonna talk to him about it, or maybe we'll talk a little bit first, have him play it, and have a little bit of time to talk afterwards. So you might wanna ask him questions about what it's like to be a composer, how do you make choices, and so on. That's what we're gonna discuss. Um, for those of you watching on video later, um, please make sure to write a comment in the section so that I know you, you viewed the video, or you could just give me a thumbs up or something, that would be great. Um, for those of you in the Music 152 um, class, who have a weekly assignment, this piece that Taro is going to play for us, um, Kittens Play Meow, um, is the piece I'd like you to focus on for the assignment this week. And um, I think that's it. Um, you can find the program on the calendar link online. And I think that's enough talking, and we'll turn it over. Please welcome Taro. Um, So, okay, so maybe I want to start first with, since I told you we're, we're discussing um, telling stories without words, using music to tell stories. Um, do you write yourself, do you write a fair amount of program music? Is that something you typically do, or? Yes, I think I do that, yeah. And, and mostly for solo guitar, or do you play, do you write uh, for other? No, I also write for ensembles. Yeah. All size ensembles? Um, mostly for guitar and violin or flute. Okay. Uh, because I play with violinists a lot, and or flutists. And then I write um, um, medium-sized ensembles. Uh, so we're talking about maybe five or six instruments. And is there a practical reason for that? Well, the practical one is the guitar and violin. That's yeah. the easiest. That's because, easy, right? Because then I'm playing and I just need one more person to play with me. Yeah, you don't have to plug in anywhere. You don't have to bring a piano yeah. with you. you Having know. five, six players, that, that gets a little bit difficult. Just just, just getting together and, and the funding becomes an issue because I, I got to pay these people to play. Right. And so now it's easy to come up with the money. Right, so writing chamber music can have you know artistic and practical considerations in terms of just where do you fund it, how do you fund it, uh, how do you get together for rehearsals and so on, right? Yeah. So then related to program music, maybe just as a short introduction, you might say a few things about wh when, you're, when you have a story in mind that you want to tell musically, then what kinds of things do you do or look for um, to help you tell that story? So this one is actually an etude. Okay, so I yeah, set up... Etude means a study. So it's right. a piece that is written for students to learn how to play to, for certain techniques on the guitar, let's say. So I, I wanted to write a piece that was um, a study for right hand. Okay, so there's a lot of arpeggios, just, just right hand motion. And when I set out to write uh, this particular etude, um, I wanted to borrow this, this arpeggio pattern that Brazilian guitar composer, well he's not a guitar guitar composer, but um, Bill Lobos, he wrote this famous guitar YouTube that uses this pattern. Um, so I wanted to somehow use that in my piece. And, and this is where the program music comes in, where I have two kittens, well they were kittens back then, and so I used to see them run around and play. So I thought it would be perfect to use this pattern. Because this reminds me of them running in circle in my backyard. Um, and what's nice about this pattern and the way guitar is structured, um, you could have high notes, uh, um, below the low notes. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Just the way the, the strings are structured. Uh, you could be playing something here. Um, um, wait, let's see. Oh, better yet, look here. So this lower note is, is actually the second string, which is actually supposedly a higher note. I'm getting a lower pitch because I'm hitting higher a fret on the uh, lower string. 
So that creates this really int intricate rhythm as I play with this uh, right hand pattern. Um, so, so, um, so there's a rhythmic component to this piece uh, where these notes are just shooting out sort of like the way maybe kittens are just like playing with their paws and so forth. Um, so if you could just like listen up for those kind of things. Okay. Um, that pattern is really hard to do on, on, on a piano, for example. Um, that works just, it's just the way the guitar strings are put together. So you could use that kind of pattern. But if you were to do that on, let's say, on a keyboard, um, you would have a very difficult time. I mean, at least you can't play at this tempo. Uh, because there's a lot of repeated notes. And, and because I can play same note in multiple strings. Um, so that's why I'm able to play like DDD, you know, and then follow by next note, for, for example. Whereas on the keyboard, you have to hit, say, D three times in a row, and you can't just keep playing that. Um, so 
But I, I have actually rearranged this for two, two keyboards. Hmm. Uh, on two keyboards, it's possible. Yeah. Well, that brings up an interesting question. Thanks, Juan, for asking that. Is because we because we discussed a little bit in class this week about orchestration and right. listening to Berlioz, and they listened to pictures at an exhibition, and we heard different versions of it. We heard the original piano. We heard the Ravel orchestration. Or we heard a synthesizer, Tomita synthesizer <laughs> version, and and then a thrash metal version of it. Right. So to compare all these things, but maybe you can speak a little bit as a composer about orchestrating and. Let's say when you're you're writing for a larger, a little bit larger ensemble, like a quintet or something, how do you decide what instruments you want or what's going to work the best? Or, um, so I usually write on my guitar, and you you compose you write yeah, first. I, I compose. Uh, well, um, yeah, it's it's an interesting process. I I. I so writing to me is almost like a painting. So I I, I write in a more if maybe uh, in a more polyphonic sort of manner when I write for multiple instruments. So I'm not thinking in terms of of, of chords so much. So, um, so polyphonic, I, right? Rather than rather than thinking of the music vertically like these notes go together, he's thinking more that each individual line is playing. So like in that Lakuta piece we heard, that one section where I said, doesn't it sound like the instruments are fighting each other a little bit? They all had an in different individual line that were all moving through space in a, in a horizontal right. direction. So when I, when I assign instruments, I'm thinking more in terms of color. So I, you know, like certain instruments speak to me differently and, and so I, I see different colors and I just draw lines. And, and that's how I approach writing for mm -hmm. multiple instruments. Yes, sir. Do you keep like a, a journal of ideas that you may then go back to and go, oh, I remember I had this, I'm going to borrow that for this piece? Or... No, I, I, I usually just write, start writing, um, and I just work on that one piece for a while. And, and do you write with, with a story in mind, or, in, or more, not always, more not abstractly? Always. Sometimes, but sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes, yes. Interesting. Okay. Any, any other questions about that? Or? Yeah. Have you have you inspired yourself with your, when you did like a block? Um. Well, luckily I haven't had that yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it will happen in the future. Um. But I just listen. Um. So so I, like like I, I I said you know it's almost like a painting for me. So. Just like the way painters are looking for subject to paint. I, I just listen, and then usually there is something that um, that not so much inspires me, but I hear something. You you mean you listen to sounds around you or yeah. other, or other music? Uh, or? Just sound, sounds around me. Okay. And usually that becomes uh, sort of the motive for um, my composition. So I, I, I just let's try to listen. Okay. And have you been have you ever been commissioned to write something? Yeah, um, so uh, this, this famous Japanese artist, he had an a opening show for his sculpture exhibition in, in China, and he wanted um, me to compose a piece for it, and he flew us out there. And, Did you play it live? Yeah, yeah, so, so at the opening? This violinist and I, he, he flew us out, and we performed at this museum in Nanjing, China. And, and did he give you um, suggestions for what he wanted? He, he gave me the title, actually. Okay. Yeah, it's called Next Door Sky, and that was it. And that was it? Yeah. And then what did you do to, to inspire yourself for the music? Did you... Well, that one was rather, rather difficult because he gave me the assignment. Okay. Because usually I, I, I just start writing when I want to. Right. Uh, whereas this one was commissioned, so... But, but was it like, a, did you look at his sculpture and then get ideas, or did you... I, I spoke to him about it. Okay. Yeah, just to get a sense of what he, uh, what this concept behind this, this idea. Okay. Yeah. And did it feel, um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, throughout history, some composers with, you know, had a love-hate relationship with commissions, because obviously they needed the money, but they didn't want to be told what to do. They, right. And, it, you know, is there, a, is, have you ever had an experience like that, where someone wants you to write something that you're really not that interested in? Um, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, it's always fun for me to just write, and also it's, it's fun for me to, well, I mean, I can't turn down going to China, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but, um, no, I, I haven't had that. Yeah, I, I'm just always happy to write. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Yes, Benjamin. Uh, since the subject came up, do you have any, like, tips for people who want, might want to commission something to not drive the person they're hiring crazy or to make things go more smoothly? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, since the subject came up, do you happen to have any like general tips for someone oh, who might be commissioning something to not drive the person they're hiring crazy and to make oh, things yeah. more smoothly? <laughs> well, that one's difficult because like, everybody obviously reacts differently to these things. Like yeah. for me, I'm, I'm just happy to get any kind of commission. Um, maybe because I'm not that busy as a composer yet. Maybe that's that's another thing. Like if maybe if you're if you're you know like always being commissioned and and you have all these projects lined up, maybe you become a little pickier about uh, what kind of job you accept. But um, I mean, not that busy. <laughs> maybe then maybe that's. The, yeah, and imagine if you were a composer that had done it a lot and people was that you might have more control over the situation True, by yeah. saying, well, I'm so-and-so, I've done this a lot, you, you need to leave me alone, you need right. to let me do what I want to do and not get in my way. Right, right. But I think that you know, most commissions, I think, would be, at least today, would be based on the idea that well, we like this person anyway, we already like their music, so we're going to trust them that they're going to write something that's as good as everything we've heard before. So. Focus on trying to find someone who's already inclined to do what you're looking for and maybe trust them. Together. Now, I think maybe, maybe not apart from commissioning, but I have noticed with film scoring that is slightly different um, because they are expecting a very specific specific style of music yeah. for a scene. And there, there's not much, I mean, there is some creativity, but you just have to go with what the director wants. Yeah, it's, it's often typical, if you correct me if I'm wrong, for film scoring, it, they will s give the composer a, a scene to look at that has no music and say, and maybe give it to several composers and say, here, write music for this three minute scene. And then they'll see the different versions that they get and then say, that's the style we want. Yeah, or, or uh, they will sometimes even give you a scene with a song that they like. Oh. So they already have a specific style in their head. Oh, I see. You know, um, it's kind of like a vision. So I, yeah. I wrote this score for this Japanese horror film once. And they were saying, that we want it to sound like 28 Days Later. Oh, I mean, yeah. the director just wanted that thing. What's the film? I want to watch it. Uh, it's called Chain. Chain? Yeah, Chain. Okay. Um, and, oh, so and they had a specific idea. So he had like very specific score in his mind already. Okay. So I had to kind of assimilate that into what I was going to create. I see. Hmm. Um, and, and this is why I think some people, because um, I, I, when I was working on, on one other score project, uh, he was a logic engineer. And he said he's never going to work on film score again because he just hated the fact that it was we were constantly being told what to do, hmm. and he felt that there were there was less um, creative freedom hmm. on our end. Hmm. Um, but I kind of like that challenge, um, so I, I didn't mind so much. Yeah. Interesting. All right, maybe one more question. Yeah, John. Um, what tune were you playing in? Oh, this was just just. Regular tuning. Standard tune? Yeah. What's yeah. your favorite tune? Standard tune, is that like... Yeah, standard tuning. Um, I mean, I, I, I could see... I, I do like the detuning sometimes. Mm -hmm. But for composing, I, I tend to stick to the standard tuning. Um, if anything, you know, if I wanted to drop D, then I, I think I want to get a 7 string guitar or something. Um, but I, I think it's nice to have that. Um, uh, just, just I mean, it's, it's easy for me to think about it when I'm trying to write something down. Okay, excellent. All right, let's we'll say thank you one more time.
we'll give Taro a few minutes break. And please, you're welcome to hang around. Uh, the, the, you see the program I handed out. The concert will start in about seven or eight minutes, and you're welcome to stay for it if you do. And if you do, and you want some extra credit, please make sure you sign my clipboard on the way out so I, knew that you, I know that you stayed for the concert. Thank you.